Rishi uh, has a publication uh, list, The Length of My Arm, very extensively published. Uh, he has a, an undergrad and a master's, both from the University of Toronto in Religious Studies and a PhD from the University of Toronto in Sociology. <laughs> Close -ish? Almost right. Anyways, um, <laughs> I'm going to keep forging on here. Um, he also uh, has uh, served as an adjunct professor uh, at the University of Calgary and at Wilfrid Laurier University. And I don't know if you know this, but both of those are my alma maters. Oh, right. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, he uh, has been a professor of sociology in South Africa, a dean of social sciences in the Middle East, and we are lucky to have him here in our community as an instructor of sociology at NWP. And tonight, he is going to be talking about well, a relatively heavy subject that he is going to make clear for us. Uh, the separation of church and state in 21st century in ca Canada. And you may ask, does he have the academic chops to do this? Well, I would answer by saying, well, was Paul Morphy a chess prodigy uh, for, who was kind of at the top of his game in the 1850s and was well known for uh, having both uh, an aggressive style and uh, being particularly innovative? What's the answer? Yes. So he does have the chops. There we go. All right. So join me. Put your hands together for Dr. Rashid. Thanks, Sean, for inviting me. And whatever you said, divide by four. Can I put it in here? Okay, so this fancy topic, separation of church and state, the separation of church and state in the 21st century. Now, of course, it sounds like a very difficult one. It is a, a very complex topic, of course. And I'll try to simplify it and and, and get it across as succinctly and as simply as possible. Having said that, the separation of church and state is perhaps, in, certainly in Euro-American society, one of the more important driving forces towards human behavior. And when I first thought about a topic for tonight, I thought, having teaching Canadian society is one of my courses, and having spent the last few years on my A study in Canadian history, uh, there were a few things that kind of stood out, and I thought maybe if I did this topic in a certain way, I can shed some light as to an understanding in Canadian society of Canadian society. So hence, that's the motivation. I hope this works. Yes. So when we speak about the separation of church and state, we really think about this process that we know of as the process of secularization, the secular. And per definition, secularization is the process by which the institution of religion is slowly removed from other institutions within society. In other words, for the longest time, Let's say 5,000 years. It's kind of interesting, my students will, will, will support me. Here. That at a certain time, sometimes in human history, some smart people come along and they say, whatever you've done for the last 5,000 years, making God so important within your understanding of your lives, your behavior, your world, it's time to remove that. So, this, by definition, this, the definition of the secular or secularization, this process, is the systematic removal of religion, as Michael will support me here, by Peter Berger and people like that, as the overarching umbrella within society. And that every institution should be, roughly be on its face independently without having religion, this overarching view, her view, in terms of decision making. So, but that's, basically separation of church and state as we understand it. But secularization and this process is not a singular phenomenon. It is rather complex. It's like a 
totalizing dynamism. So what I've done is I've kind of pointed out a few for you. Besides the separation of state, it comes with a few uh, added extras. The first is that this notion of rationalism and empiricism, whereby it emphasizes the importance of reason above religious dogma, for example. So religion is slowly but surely relegated to its own sphere through this process. Then there's also humanism, as we know. I'll, I'll highlight a few of that later on examples that emphasizes the value of agency of human, the human being individually and collectively rather than, let's say, the church having some sort of overarching influence. Then pluralism, very important in this notion, is the idea that societies should value pluralism, acknowledge and accommodate diversity beliefs, diversity of beliefs, etc., lifestyles within single communities, etc. And then a secular type of morality. In other words, ethical principles, moral judgments can be grounded in secular reasoning rather than and human experience rather than dependence on the church to set religious ethics and morality. And then freedom freedom of conscience. In other words, you have the right to believe whatever you want and respect other people's beliefs. And some of the thinkers that kind of contribute in, in this regard over the two centuries, two and a half centuries, would be famous people like Baroque Spinoza, John Locke, the Americans James Madison, I think he was the fourth president, and certainly contributed to the American charter and so on. Voltaire, you know, the French philosopher. Then also Jefferson, I think he was the third president of the United States. Diderot, Montesquieu, and of course the famous Immanuel Kant. So certainly Kant was a serious enlightenment thinker along these lines. Writes a very important text called Religion Within the Boundaries of Mere Reason. Religion Within the Boundaries of Mere Reason. I remember as a student at U of T, PhD student doing coursework. The professor gave us this text to read. And when I read it, I made, found myself constantly making notes on the side. And when I went to my class seminar, I said to the professor, you know what, if Immanuel Kant had read Islamic philosophy, he wouldn't have written a single word of this text. And they all laughed at me. A few months later, the university asked me to, to not interview, but certainly spend time with a new uh, professor that they wanted to employ. And he was from Frankfurt. And I said to him, he was a Kantian expert. And I said to him, well, I really don't know Kant. I've only read religion within the boundaries of mere reason. And, he, and I said to him, you know, in a shy, coy way, I said to him, I wrote on the side there that if this dude had met Islamic philosophy, he may not even have written this book. And he said, I'll do you a favor. When I get back to Frankfurt, I'll send you a copy in his hand of text that he's written. And lo and behold, a month later, it came in the mail, and it started like this. In the name of God, the most gracious, the most merciful. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. In other words, I don't think I was too far off to see the Islamic influences in Kant's work. Be that as it may, this process of secularization, I must add, is a Euro-American phenomenon. It has absolutely nothing to do with the rest of the world politically. It is Christian. There are not even words in Arabic or in Tibetan or in Sanskrit where you, you'll struggle to find this word secular, secularization, even the concept. So what am I arguing here? That in many cases, especially in Canada, is incongruent with forms of Christianity. For example, Mennonites, Hakkites, and some Christian denominations that promote more, my students will understand a little bit more of this, a type of mechanical type of mode of life. In fact, when I do research on the Hakkites, for example, they argue that they promote secularization. But they promote secularization 
while at the same time live a lifestyle of what we call a type of closer solidarity in a mechanical way, which is doesn't quite fit the notion of all those processes of the secular. I mean, maybe this gives me an opportunity to remind you, like capitalism or democracy or any of these fancy things that we spew out, they are ideal types. There's no one democracy in the world. There's no one capitalism in the world. There's no one secular in the world. The different institutions, histories of different peoples come together to unfurl in a certain way with this ideal typical, this is the secular, we're going to be uh, have diverse society, etc. And maybe at this point I'm going to add, or before I say that, let me take a sip of water, and maybe tell you that I always tell my students that in sociology I'm a methodological atheist. In other words, that doesn't mean I'm an atheist. It means from a scientific perspective that I play it as it lies. I just say it as I read it and the research that I did. The truth is the truth. So I don't have any, I don't care really about this stuff, but I certainly care from, from, from a scientific perspective. You kind of get that. So it gets rough sometimes, but please, it's not my opinion. It is research that I'm trying to unravel and understand. Is that okay? Any questions? Wait till the end. <laughs> okay. Let me go back there. So roughly this process of secularization over the last 200 years affected 20% at max of the world. That's the first. The second, as I argue, that processes of secularization and geopolities that where this is engaged and used, they don't necessarily follow the, the, the notion and the model that I showed earlier on. For example, if you think of colonial periods, including in Canada all the way in my research up until the 1960s and so forth, that diversity wasn't necessarily high on the agenda of Canadian immigration. In fact, you know the history, and I'm glad that I was here to wrap up my knuckles if I go wrong. But certainly, in Canadian immigration history, it was only really till the 1970s that people of color, Africans, and so on, were allowed to immigrate to Canada. So this idea, this notion of the secular, with a very diverse acceptance, doesn't quite fit Canada <coughs> yet, because it, it utilizes some of the secular and, I guess, devalues other aspects of it. You, you get what I mean, right? So, not to be too harsh, but leave it at that. So, you can see what I'm going to try and do is give you a snapshot through data. Let's call it a cross-sectional analysis. Now for my students, and there are many here, that's why I'm so comfortable. <laughs> a cross-sectional analysis will be a single photograph in time. But we're going to look at different provinces and kind of really look at the data. And my students will be upset if I don't say this, but there's a difference between, us, between sociology and common knowledge. So we work with research. It's a social science, and hence, my work will be covered with social, social science and scientific sort of orientation and data. So cross-sectional analysis 2029 of February 2024, that's today. And I thought this was an interesting picture. I thought this is ready for tonight. Okay, so this is the world's busiest highway. It's in Ontario. I like it because it's recent. Um, my family and myself, we live right around there for the last few decades. My kids, my everyone, mom, dad, we grew up right there. So I thought that was interesting. But what I would like to do at the end is to ask some of those people to open the doors of their cars so that you can see what they look like. So let's wait till the end and see what they look like. It also, the picture, Sean, I'm trying to do a visual ethnography. 
So we're reading this text, and the first thing that comes comes to my mind when I look at that picture is, if this is Ontario, how does, in orders of magnitude, how does Ontario fit within the polity canon? So all I can do is look at stats and numbers, and very quickly I realize that of the 36 million 500 people, 500,000 people in Canada in 2021 census, 14 million people live in Ontario. In other words, it's a sizable population in Canadian society. Get that in. And I mustn't forget to open the doors. So, okay, I have no answers at this stage. This is social science. It can't be answered because the research needs to be done. Only at the end of research and analysis. Oh, so sorry, sir. Hey, you need to use the mic, guys. Thank you. You could have just said it. <laughs> so, I have no answers at this stage. For my students, you cannot be dogmatic, you cannot be obdurant. That's the word I taught you last week. Make sure that you have the data and analysis before you do things. So, if I had to re-title, and I struggled with the title, the first one shown throughout it was called Religion Within the Boundaries of Mere Reason. I thought I'd probably can't but he would accept it. So if I had to retitle it, I would say, towards an understanding of the separation of church and state around the first quarter of the 21st century Canada. But then if I have this topic, I also thought, what would my thesis statement be? What would the research questions be, that type of thing? And students listen carefully. When you do research, it's a kind of strange process in that you want to write thesis statements, you want to write research questions, but you really don't know what it's all about, really, so it kind of works backwards. You first find out, do I have the tools to do the data analysis? Let's say you're looking at statistics and stuff like that, big numbers, or qualitative materials, books and so on, interviews. So it's a kind of backward forward type of process, right? So. Some of the thesis statements and research questions that come to my mind after reading a bit and trying to box around this topic is the process of secularization in Canada in the 21st century is incongruent, under stress, with religions transplanted into Canada through the country's immigration policies and material needs. That's the first one. There are others. In Canadian history, major political decisions were made largely driven by material conditions and less so ideologically. Just as I read through Canadian history, I'm kind of not sure what's going on. So try to make sense of it. If a sovereign state, this one I came up with today, if a sovereign state is defined by its ability to, to decide its legal environment independently, then Canada is arguably the youngest nation on the planet. Anybody tell me why I say that? Okay, we'll see in During the baby boomer generation, 1960s, Canadian politics started shifting their support in favor of big capital and increasingly away from Canadianness. And Canadian became less and less important in politics. Big picture, okay? And then, what methodology would I use? Since I only really like one, so I went with historical sociology, a methodology towards under, that understanding. So I'm gonna, so like, let me try that. And what is that? It's kind of going through, and what I'm really doing is something like this. I'm gonna show you a picture, but the lens that I'm shining the picture to you at is maybe 200 years. So along the 200 year trajectory, I come to today. You see today the picture, but my methodology looks at historical structural changes, socio-political over the last couple of centuries in Canada, along with this process of secularization from the middle of the 1700s, beginning of the 1800s through to today. So major structural political changes read through the lens of social theory. In other words, I know the social theory as that the social theory and the Canada superimpose that on the structural, political, social theory, etc. over time. 
And maybe I thought, why don't I do this? I'll make a list, and I made a list with red and, and blue. So the first lot, I had to start somewhere. So I thought, well, let's go 100 and 200 years maybe. So why 1831? Because that was the establishment of the first residential school in Canada, in Brantford, Ontario. And it struck me that this was a move in the direction of assimilation rather than multiculturalism. So I thought that's a, maybe a way to look at Canada's history. And then the second date I had was 1867. That's, of course, the Dominion of Canada. And then it struck me. If the first residential school was opened in 1831, and the Dominion was formed in 1867, then there had to be some people around that decided this long-term move. And of course, my knowledge of history is not that great, but I soon found out that you had a province of, we had a province of Canada in 1941, so there were people organizing who was a political, single political entity consciousness earlier on. Of course, it was replaced in, 19, in 1867 by the Dominion of Canada. But why I choose this is because it is in direct opposition to an ideology of multiculturalism and diversity. It is assimilation. The country is not interested in having multicultural society. And to be honest, through my readings, it is quite evident that Canada is a British Commonwealth region built long term along a British kind of model. And that whoever comes to this country comes from, immigrants come from Europe, Chinese, if they come here, they're going to be brought here for labor only. They won't be allowed to bring their kids. We call them satellite kids. They stay away. They stay in China. And we make it very difficult for them to stay here. And very soon, we'll cut it off. So at a certain point in that trajectory, they're no longer allowed to come here as immigrants. Later on, we apologize, but that's how it happened, right? So you can see this notion in this, if I may use the German terminology in sociology, my students know, the Verstehen, the interpretive methodology here, suggests in a type of Iberian interpretation that assimilation is by far uh, racialized, hence diversity. As I said earlier on, diversity is questionable in the secular process because it is a kind of quasi type of secularization that has diversity along color lines. Now, of course, I've, I know the deal that way. I've published on race and stuff like that, and certainly very interested over the years. And I see the same sort of pattern in other colonial environments, especially British. So, so the date there, massive immigration into Canada at the beginnings of the 1900s, millions from Europe, none from Asia, Africa, besides the Chinese, to work on the railway system. And you heard the word Qing, right? You know where that comes from? So every time they hit the metal, Qing, Qing, Qing. So we use the rock. Believe me, there are many terms. Italians are wops without passports. It's just how it goes. Uh, and by the way, Canadians are manji cakes. So there's a type of terminology they use. They sit in the Mortons and they manji cakes. So every time they, it's a derogatory term, but it's just, please, I don't mean anything. Remember, I'm an atheist, <laughs> a methodological atheist. And I just say it. So you can, you can scold me afterwards. I'm no, no longer interested after this lecture. <laughs> so here's the deal. So you can see that immigration is massive by the millions at the turn of the century. And then comes the First World War, decline, Second World War, decline. And post Second World War, while at the same time, it is assimilation. There is no multiculturalism as a, a deal for Canada. So after the Second World War, something interesting happens. Hence my comment on materialism trumps ideology. 
And through my readings, it's only my opinion at this stage, but certainly, and I checked, there are some others who kind of hint in that direction, that we are the neighbors of the biggest economy in the history of humankind. Now you know what happens when you're a neighbor of a very wealthy geopolity. You can become even wealthier because you don't even have to spend as much money on military warfare. You have a neighbor that will protect you. So we have opportunity in Canada to build an economy that's never seen before in Canada. But we don't have the population. So the beginnings of speaking about the potential of getting more people, skilled people, into this country. So the hints after the Second World War as the lure of big bucks glares at us across the border. So you start hearing the talks, the rumblings of, why don't we get some people from Asia? Why don't we get some people from Africa? And if you look at the population numbers, there were serious declines in birth rates from the beginning of the 1900s onwards, serious decline. The numbers that I see in the beginning, at the beginning of the century, 4.1 kids per family. And then depression years, it goes down below three. And it keeps going down and down and down. When we get to the Second World War period, we 1.5 something. So we need to do something about this because here's this opportunity. Be that as it may, the boom, baby boomer economics of the United States. The United States had never ever experienced such a wealthy period ever in its history. Britain was destroyed. They needed the industry, this part of the world, in order to supply. We had factories, we had, we had real opportunity. And then, of course, 1971, stronger moves towards increasing a population. Multiculturalism as a policy began to be seeded. Multiculturalism is not yet promulgated and in, in the Constitution yet, but certainly big ideas about multiculturalism for the future. So I jump a bit to 1982, and for fun I'm going to say we live in Pierre Elliott Trudeau's Canada. Based on my limited reading, and I have Daryl here so you can always wrap me over the knuckles. So, Pierre Elliott Trudeau and his creation of the Constitution. Let the Queen fly out here, and they signed on the steps of Parliament building the whole world to see that Canada is finally an independent, sovereign country. For the first time, hence my argument that this is the youngest quality political entity in the world. So, with this, of course, the signing of the Canadian Charter of Rights, and freedoms, and of course this was problematic because the Quebecois would now, people of Quebec would be not be so interested in signing away some sort of authority, final power, final authority. In fact, not all provinces were happy, but certainly the Quebecois decided never to sign it. So I take that as the turning point, the shift from assimilation to multiculturalism. And here we have, for example, Brian Mulroney takes over from Trudeau and he's set on getting, I think it was Bourassa, to get Pierre Bourassa onto his side and to at least have the Quebec region support his, this idea. So he calls Meech Lake and he calls all the premiers across Canada to a gathering and he's offering special position for Quebec and the French are happy that they're going to be singled out as different and of course it never worked because the First Nations people started asking but we also want our difference and the Ukrainians and you everybody else the Albertans and everyone else wanted to share in that special status it failed on the eve of 1990 so it was up until 1990 that they had the opportunity to ratify the Mitch Lake Accord, it didn't work. I chose the Multiculturalism Act, and on the eve that it didn't work, Canada promulgated the Multiculturalism Act. And unfortunately for Quebec, 
they had a couple of legs cut off from the table in that the constitution was such that they had to kowtow to the Supreme Court as a final decision maker. This is something that they were not very interested in at the time. So Canada reaches its high Canada reaches its highest immigration population over the last century this year with places like Ontario having 51.5% people living there of the 14 million that were not born there. So kind of interesting, students take note, you need numbers, you need support, you can't just make arguments. So let's just take a step back. So how is it possible then for Canada and the Euro-American society to propagate and to move along an ideology of the secular secularization, separation of church and state. Of course, they have the three levers of power, which is economics, politics, and culture. Without one of them, they would struggle. I can give you an example. In Quebec, for example, they've been there a long time. They, the British came there a long time ago. They were never able to wrestle total power from Quebec and in the, one reason only, they could never wrestle the cultural lever of Quebec, the Quebecois people. They certainly had money, they certainly had politics, but they were never able to beat the Catholic Church and its culture as part of that tripartite alliance in power formation. You can see culture is a very important component of power. However, let's move faster to the big screen. New shared power. The new world of the secular now has to entertain the potential of economic economic shifts to place new organizations like BRICS. For those of you who don't know, BRICS is an acronym for Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. And the deal here is that they are not as pleased as before to have their money valued arbitrarily. Oh, your money is worth 15. You need 15 of yours for one of ours. These people are getting smarter, and they're saying we want to form our own economic units. And before I came here, I checked their GDPs to see jointly how big they are. They're definitely at least as big, let's say the global GDP is 100 trillion. The United States will contribute a quarter, 25 trillion. BRICS will contribute slightly, just those countries, slightly more than 25 trillion. In other words, this, this is a serious threat to economic global power as we've known it for the last century and a half, two centuries. Politics, the new consciousnesses that are developing in a more globalized world, which includes this overpowering consciousness that says human beings are equal. And that shared consciousness that we place higher today within society is permeating the entire globe with globalization. It is ubiquitous. So culture, new media forms, globalization, immigration, and of course finally a possible post nation state idea. Some politicians, political scientists argue that we're beyond nationalism and maybe we had a post nation state era. So why not? In Canada, why is the secular under so much duress? First, of course, Canada's geography. Massive country, maybe the biggest, second biggest in the world, certainly. Rural religiosity is something that we cannot discount because people are more, let me use that word again, mechanistic. They stick together, they have a stronger sense of believing. And the second one, belonging. So that combination of believing and belonging is certainly very strong within rural society, Canada. The other is, of course, competing ideology. You have secularization, and then you have multiculturalism. By this time, of course, multiculturalism is policy, ideology, politically invested, and of course, sociologically practiced 
So you bring people to the country, say, come to this country, but we'll support you, you stay your side, we stay our side, we have separation, we, we really, we, we support you in, in, in whatever endeavor, I'm saying it maybe in a very ugly way, but the point here is, it's not a type of ideology that fosters a nationhood, a shared memory of experiences. It is very singular in that it divides people into different and, and respect and so on. And we celebrate that and remember I don't know the answers and I don't have an opinion, I'm just saying how I kind of reading it. So the changing global landscape, now 20% of the secular world has to mix with 80% of people who have never even heard of this term. So transnationalism, new global economic directions, and of course I had the unexpected accidents of history. Imagine we had a third world war, and we have 60 million people die as we did with the first and second combined. Goodbye secularization. So this always happens, this is the nature of world events. We can plan and plan, but we cannot work for the latent and some of those unexpected stuff. So the secular became our collective consciousness, our dominant understanding, but not for all Canadians. And certainly not for immigrants. And for many, it will never become the collective consciousness as the primary consciousness. So the questions that come to mind, how important were material conditions in the construction of ideas in Canadian history? How central were notions of the secular being a growing multi-religious polity where multiculturalism seemingly opposes strong ideas of separation of church and state? Are we perhaps the forerunner of a post-nation state geopolitics? In other words, is the idea of a Canadian collective national consciousness a spent force? Are we ready to usher in a new direction? As done a few centuries, centuries earlier when they said, well, forget about the 5,000 years of your forefathers and your grandfathers and grandparents and the importance they value they put on religion. The new world we go into will eliminate that. So I look at Census Canada for your view. Some quick facts. There are more, more than 250 ethnic or cultural origins in Canada. That's pretty unique. And by the way, multiculturalism is uniquely Canada in its beginnings. So the top origins reported in Canada would be Canadian, 5.7 million of the 36.5 million, and by the way, the term Canadian used in census data in Canada, anybody tell me when that started? When was the term Canadian used in Canadian census data? 1996. Yeah. It was the first time the word Canadians were counted in the census. English, 5.3 million, Irish, 4.4 million, Spanish, 4.4 million. French 4 million. In 2021, over 19 million people reported a Christian religion, representing just over half of the Canadian population, 53%. 200 years of secularization in a country that is strongly supporting the secular ends up with 53% Christian after 200 years. Approximately 12, 12 million people in Canada, more than one third, reported having no religious affiliation. There's always numbers and then there's qualitative analyses, so I'll say something about that in a minute. While small the proportion of Canada's population who report being Muslim, Hindu or Sikh, they make up roughly 10% of Canadian population at the moment and growing. And of course, qualitatively, they have young kids. So if I look at the census data, it's difficult to see, so I know, so I kind of made another graph for you. But it shows the number of Christian in the light blue, the dark blue, the no religion, and the orange, the 
new immigrant population with religion. So let me do that. So I can I summarize it, I know it's still bad. But Ontario has about roughly almost 70% people report that they are religious versus 51% who are no religion. So in other words, it's significant because there are 14 million people. They argue by 2030 there will be 7.5 million people living in Toronto, the megalopolis. And if I didn't mention it before, that's the center of the universe. <laughs> it is, it really is. So Quebec has kind of same type of split, 72% versus 27%, with 8 million so significant. How about Alberta? 60% basically 60-40 split with 4 million people. When I count those numbers that I've put down there, it's almost the entire population with the sprinklings and all on the other. So I opened the door of the cars, by the way, on the 401, and these are the people that came out. The first one, uh, I deliberately did that. Those are Muslims. And by the way, I've been there. And I promise you, they have three gatherings like that, back to back to back, because they don't, don't have space. And all the mosques, most of the mosques that you go to were built with churches before, with church buildings that they purchased. These are Sikhs in Vancouver. Uh, these are Hindus in Ontario. Mennonites. Christians. And interestingly enough, this, now this picture was a picture of Christians in protest against the secular. And here we go. I thought to end my lecture, I'm going to bring a picture that I got yesterday that you may know. This guy's name is Tucker Carlson. And he warns Canadians of destruction of you and your culture. My question to Tucker Carlson is, what culture, Tucker Carlson? Okay, so again, if you think about it, multiculturalism is new in Canada. It was first state law 1988. In fact, I know the date, 21st of July, 1980, was the day that it was promulgated into state politics. So if you think back, that's a couple, a couple of decades. I'm older than that. So, yeah, so it's, uh, before that, it's not at all. So multiculturalism, in fact, that's why I argue that this is, is a different Canada. Before 1982, was a different Canada. 1982 onwards, when, Mr. Pierre Elliott Trudeau, when he signed that document, he was adamant when I watched some of his speeches, when I watched some of his videos and interviews, that dude had something in mind. He wanted to ship this country. So I joke, I mean, cheek, that we live in Pierre, Pierre Elliott, who goes to Canada, but maybe there's some truth in that. I mean, he was obdurant. He wanted his way or bust. So you, you can see multiculturalism, of course they sold it, they had to sell it. We are a declining population, we need immigrants. No immigrants, no Canada financially. It is a very important component of Canadian society. We will make up, most of us in this room are immigrants, we will make up 30% of Canadian population in four and a half years. Predicted. In fact, 30% of people that are retired or immigrants. So you can see that demographic. We're getting on in life. And we have really aging immigrant population in this country. I think that's best I can answer. But if every country has immigration, every country is different. Except that in our case, I think it's driven by material need. We need, we need immigrants, and we play with those numbers, immigration, depending on our needs. So if we decide we need plumbers, we'll increase that. 
it's not a matter of anybody's welcome, no. It is a calculated phenomenon. Immigration serves the country's economic needs. Megan? Do you want to talk about how the ideology of multiculturalism differs from the ideology of melting pot of the Yeah, sure. In fact, Megan, the first time I set foot in North America, I wanted to feel that melting pot versus Canada. And I mean, there's all this negative hype about America and so on. So I spent, I took off when I spent a couple of weeks in the United States just browsing around so that I can kind of feel the melting pot. And the first thing I realized coming from apartheid South Africa, I'm kind of sensitive when it comes to racism and stuff like that. First, hotels, motels, restaurants and so on. I felt very at home. They spoke Spanish to me. Very quickly I learned a few Spanish words. Because it is, you are American first. There is some value to that type of identity versus the multiculturalism. Multiculturalism reminds me a little bit of a Dutch type of division. And the Dutch word for it is for Zoyle. It's a sociological term. It means literally translated polarization. Every society within its own sphere. And money is spent in that direction. In Canada, billions are spent to keep people separated. The one thing I'm sensitive when I read my students' essays and so on, there are a few things that I pick up very quickly. And one is, my students don't have a sense of Canadian national consciousness. It's missing, unfortunately. So if that answers you, in America, it's different. You're American first. Anybody else? Go for it, Joe. Do it. Okay. <laughs> I just gave you the answer. We are, I'm going to use for my students, they know the term. We are in a state of anomie, normlessness. We don't know. That's really where we are. There's a state of anomie in Canada. And I'm going to give you my bias in the research. I didn't say it up front. I really signed to become a Canadian when I ran away from apartheid. I wanted to be a Canadian. All that fancy stuff. I was actually studying and learning all those things. I wanted to be a Canadian man. Never happened. I know me, dislocatedness, a sense of dislocation. Yep. So, in that idea of like this, you want to be me, you want to be me, what an image, because I mean, I'm born and raised here, I don't know, just like to immigrate. Yes. Is, it, is there that want to, no. to kind of assimilate and become a part of a whole? And, it, and as Canada, because we don't like to offend anybody. We, we like to keep you in your culture and be like, yeah. no, 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 you don't need our culture, you keep your culture. But is there a desire for that? Very good question. And it changes from democratic to democratic, but I'm going to try and answer you. Certainly with me, my siblings, hundred of us in Canada have been here a long time. Mom, dad, brothers, sisters, kids, whatever. We wanted to be Canadian. So we got educated here. We, I don't have I don't have a sense of national commitment to any other country but Canada right now. I've never had. I moved around the world to work because it's, I like sociology that way. But in terms of where I'd like to die, where I'd like to end, it's Canada. And my, all my family they stayed. They never moved, and they love it home. 
I saw that out there. Yeah. So they're still there. And uh, they are, this is interesting, I kind of do my little pilot studies and speak to students. And the one thing that I found in Grand Prairie was our immigrant population. And of course, don't this, this is not scientific, this is just me speaking to students. Students are very happy to get a PR card. When I ask them the second question, are you going to take citizenship? They say, but we have one already. We Indians. But I mean, that is just my surface research. But I get the sense that this idea of being a Canadian, maybe we are to blame for not developing a sense of Canadianness. Let me, let me rephrase that. The strongest marker of a national consciousness is a shared memory of experiences. We speak 177 languages on a daily basis in Toronto. Language is not a marker of national consciousness. But we don't invest in shared memory. I often tell my students, this is the closest you will come to being Canadian. You're sharing your education in the same classroom with a diverse group of students. Relish this. This is it. We need more of that. We have multiculturalism, but we don't have connection. We have a sense of believing, but there's no belonging from a religious perspective. Any other questions? Yeah. Go for it. So because the number is so big in Ontario, can it be in Ontario the same as it can be in Alberta? No. So, in Canada, <laughs> that makes the problem even more, yes. So, so I, I, I started at the beginning by saying I don't have answers. I can. I'm only trying to shed light on the topic. But certainly, regionalism is an important political dimension in Canadian politics. And my friend will tell you here that nothing that you see today is in isolation. There's some sort of historical background. I mean, even political parties in Quebec, they started a new when Bourassa decided to make party Quebec, that Bloc Québécois. And then the Albertans said, we also need one. You know the party. So I'm not here to promote them, but the point here is regionalism, geography, I highlighted that, Geography is an important negotiator in terms of an understanding of Canada. Second biggest country in the world geographically, large distances, rural areas, uneven spreading population. So there's no simple answer. But certainly there's also very little investment in connection. Is there a road to having a strong national consciousness? Of course. With, and a multicultural. Of course. Okay. Because what I, what I think, what I think of, so you, you, when you're saying that there's a certain lack of one at the moment, and that there's regionalization, I can't help but think that we don't. It doesn't feel like we're any more regionalized than like a country like the U.S. That one might argue is a really strong national character, but they suffer from significant regionalization. Texas wants to leave. Michigan wants to leave. Like, but they don't have a national ideology like multiculturalism from the top down, where they spend millions and millions and millions of dollars to keep people separate. To start with. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's, it's a completely different cup of tea. There's an investment here. There's, an, there's, a, there's, a, there's a policy, there are political strategies, there are social outcomes, the financial, mega financial investments. I mean, the reason why, if I tell you the reason through my reading why we still have a unified Canada and not a Quebec, and the rest of Canada, you'll be surprised. If it were not for the First Nations people in that 1995 referendum that they lost by 50.55 versus 49.45, if it weren't for First Nations people banding together to vote against separation, this would have been two countries. We have lost. That way we have to thank them. I keep thinking about the United States because in one sense 
stage of capitalism, not to be too much of a Marxist, that there's a complete distance between the ruling class and the citizen. It is almost, I would say, it doesn't even make sense to even want to analyze the level of politics versus the 350 million people. There is a gap politically that people need to understand in the research. It's like they, they live a separate existence only by themselves, and the rest are just playing games. I don't know, I'm not an expert on this area, but I certainly have thought about it. But it's, it's, it's very different, and maybe from a social theory perspective, it's that notion that Marx talks about it. At the advanced stage of modern capitalism, a form of commodity fetish will seep in. And I'll give you two examples. I'll give you one first and give you another one, what I mean by that, or what Marx means by that. It is, ah, oh, it's time to vote. Ah, oh, it doesn't matter who wins. It's like it's, I just do it. It is emotional without rational thinking. It's like people coming from Ontario, Toronto to Alberta. Oh, I paid $560,000 over asking price for a house that maybe cost 100000 to build. That's the type of, you see politics as a commodity. I'm going to apply the Marxist commodity <coughs> fetish to American attitude to politics. It's like us in Ontario, my family. Oh, yeah. man, I paid 460000 over asking, what could I do? As if the world might as well end. That's, that's commodity fetish in modernity. So it's kind of modern capitalism moves. Kind of, my friends buy Lexus and they tell me, oh, I paid 170000 I just had to have it. I hope that kind of helps the answer. Yep. So one of your questions was, are we sort of on a road to become post-Asian nation or a non-Asian nation. Yes. Do you see that as something that might be actually what happens in, in a global context? And you know, you think about it in terms of a lot of science fiction, and that is ultimately what happens in the whole world, right? That we get rid of these concepts of nation. Yes. Like that. I'm a scientist, not a magician. Having said that, yeah. I mean, we are on that road. We could be the ideal type model for the rest of the world. And if I had to rewrite the history of, let's say, colonialism, let's say everyone's not watching what I'm doing in the next year, and I'm writing textbooks about colonialism, I might, I might say Canada was decolonized in, year 18, in 1982. They were part of the colonies created by Britain just like Kenya, or South Africa, or any of those colonial countries. They had it slightly early. Ghana, Iraq. Iraq was the first nation state of independence in the Middle East, created by the way. There was no Iraq before. So you can see that yeah, maybe we had ours in 1982. I wouldn't be completely wrong if I set the definitions of sovereignty. Because up until that time, Pierre Elliott Trudeau, Trudeau was a lawyer. He certainly knew what he was doing. And he was sick and tired of not being a complete 
proclamation. But like anything, there are manifest actions in life, but they're latent responses. You can't calculate the way the outcome of the Unfortunately, the anthropological necessity. Just, I really like that you're tying in like the indigenous peoples and, and kind of that assimilation that happened in the beginning. Um, do you think that the multicultural push, the multiculturalism push here in Canada, is in cor in correlation with like the indigenous people's sovereignty and not having to fully recognize it because they recognize every group is equal multicultural in Canada, so we don't need to recognize the sovereignty of indigenous people here. I think there's some truth in what you're saying. Also remember when they were thinking about, in terms of policy, possibly getting it into politics and then eventually making laws about this stuff politically. That was the same time First Nations people were experiencing the 60s school. Yeah. Go figure. Yeah. So you can see, they were, they were never a thought. But then at the same time, like, for example, would be in the least when they adopt the melting pot idea for exactly that reason too because they can then say well we're all part of we, we've all mixed over time and therefore you can't recognize one group over yeah. another so serving the same well so you can come at it from either way except that no two qualities are the same yeah exactly the histories are very different you cannot expect the same it's almost impossible to make them another like that but that's actually a really sort of yeah, no, no, interesting please, please, please. case yeah. because our nations we became independent one year after another related to Pierre Trudeau, so yeah. Belize and Canada. Okay. So that would actually be really interesting. Sure. Yeah, like, I know they to took two very different groups as yeah. each one. So let me retract that and say I apologize and we need to <laughs> 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 um, is an ideal type and how it works out in different geographies, geopolities would be different to start with. The other thing that we mustn't forget is that we had of known history, written text, research, 5,000 years of religion. It is extremely difficult to wash away that sort of investment in human consciousness development. So we move in a certain direction, but that doesn't mean that the schooling systems in different eras, in different periods, were not great. I mean, we we yet to produce a uh, Pythagoras. It was like the third time was the third time was the story about Education took over, but education historically has so much morality. Sure, but I mean, when I analyze education as an institution, it is squarely in modern society based on the material need of a market. So, yes, no, I mean, across the world. I mean, the reason why educational edu institutions are set up in Canada was not only to start educating people for language, it's not enough to educate people for the market and for industry, but also to, funny enough when I read through the stuff, to educate Irishmen to know how to behave in the new country that they sent to. I mean, 
many, many different reasons, but the point there is there are educational systems in the other 80% of the world where they're highly successful. They invented the specs, optics, algebra, all sorts of sciences, philosophy, sophisticated philosophy in other parts of the world that we, we call it the dark ages. But they had educational systems hundreds of years before us. We only started schooling once modern industrial capitalist society demanded skilled labor. The other day, because wealthy people are not allowed to trade their time in the arts. Yeah. They're taught how to become leaders. And so that's another source of strategy. Absolutely. I mean, we'll talk later. Sure. <laughs> but, but I mean, I have something to say about that. When Gaddafi, I don't know if you know this dude, Muammar Gaddafi. Okay, he was the leader of Libya. So he sent a hundred of his students to my university. And the people they thought that I can I'm fluent in Arabic. I'm not. I just know us or that just little. Any case, I, I hosted them and I interviewed them and I said, well, what are you here for? Oh, medicine, engineering, medicine, engineering. Not a single social scientist, not a single person studying the humanities. And I joked with the students in that meeting. I said publicly, I said, if Gaddafi thinks that he doesn't need to educate social scientists and humanity students, they will find somebody to rule that country one day. It wasn't even six months and they had to go back because Gaddafi was dead and there was no money. Somebody else, and I heard Barack Obama on TV at the time say, we have $33 billion of yours in our accounts. We will show you how to rebuild that country. So you can see the importance. I mean, I was I was in the Middle East. When I first went to the Middle East, there was a position as a sociologist. I must be honest, I went for the money. <laughs> and yep. In any case, when I got there, I learned that they employed me to finish off the last PhD students to supervise them because they're killing sociology. The Prime Minister of Iraq was the Chancellor of my university, so I met him with my boss, and he said. We cannot justify educating the very students that will one day bring us down. We have to get rid of the social sciences. Can we change the name of the story? Yeah. <laughs> yep. I can't hear. Can you come closer? You can even speak Dutch. Ekus na wat is in praat? That's a very good question. I mean, there are pluses and minuses to multiculturalism, obviously. However, if as a unified entity, if we want to build a Canadian national consciousness where we're willing to die for our country, where we improve our civic responsibility. Because when a people don't have a sense of a connectedness to a place, they invest less. They feel less responsible in civic responsibility. So multiculturalism erodes that level of commitment. I may have used a small example by saying people are willing to get PR cards, but they're less likely to want to take citizenship. In other words, it's not important. Yeah, sure. Well, well you, you, you know what I mean? So multiculturalism is, uh, can be divisive, and the juries out, the literature that I read, it's 50-50. 50% of researchers in Canada buy it, and 50% write against it, roughly. Please don't. Wrap me over the knuckles. <laughs> but that's roughly what I believe in terms of literature contribution. It's a 50 50 deal. So some like it, some don't. It depends on who sells it. Yeah. Thanks for the question. Yep. Go with me.
society? Yes. Well, remember we read uh, the Karl Marx reading uh, with the Paris Commune, and that short interlude. So here's the deal. I mean, I'm, I'm going to revert a little bit to evolutionary political theory. So in evolutionary political theory, people like Herbert Spencer, for example, they will argue that you can't move from oppression straight to democracy. You first have to have some sort of destruction to oligarchy and so on. And then eventually you can develop a region for democratic, democratic purposes and so on. So to, want to try and answer your question, and you know that from the readings that we've done, that it doesn't matter what the consciousness is, according to Durkheim. Human beings will use a set of consciousnesses, even if it's bad, even if it's short-lived. Then they'll move to eventually what is morally, ethically better. But without a collective national consciousness, collective consciousnesses within society, that doesn't exist. People will find the, the in-between the oppression to the oligarchy for a short period, like in the Paris Commune, for example, with uh, Marxist writings. So yes, maybe we will have a change. Uh, maybe this is a short I mean, we've only been had multiculturalism for 40 years. It's in the grand scheme of things, that's like a wink of an eye. So we may have something else in the future. We certainly need strong leadership. I hope that helps the answer. Yep. So when we talk about developing uh, some type of national consciousness that has a more equanimous approach to kind of the ignominious attitude or religion and secularism, and multiculturalism continues to build on the most logical and specific category, do we begin that like in a grand kind of geopolitical scheme where we start from like kind of the outside down to the individual? Or do we want to start that in our education system building from the youngest up? That's an excellent question. Let me let me maybe answer to this notion of regionalism in Canada. Now when I listen to Pierre Elliott Trudeau at the time he speaks and he speaks to laity and he says normally people who are in political power they like to garnish more political power the average people they want national consciousness but if you have regionalism and you, you collect in a certain melting pot money resources power then you're less likely to give it up. So we sit in a country with years and years of a separated type of politics of regions. And the one is not willing to give up. Even Quebec, when they wanted the independence, they had some proviso there. Will the rest of you still help us financially? I mean, last year I think Alberta gave them 900 million. So you can see at the level of politics, very different at the real political level. Very different. Those people have interest. Maybe I use a social theory. When it comes to the politician, I'll just say politician, he'll have to compromise his or her ethic at some point. That's the nature of a pol pol political position, person in politics. And it looks, when I listen to Elia Trudeau, Pierre Elia Trudeau, he's speaking along those lines. He's saying, these guys don't want to sign the charter. They want to keep the separation because they want to ultimately have the overall decision-making, political decision-making. They don't want the Supreme Court to override whatever decisions they make. So they're fighting for the separate power position. But, hey. Maybe you can come up with some ideas. We can talk. Well, that's what I was going to wonder. Do you have any initial ideas on, because, like, considering that to change kind of the base of education to try and stop that kind of level of power corruption, that has to first come from the political powers. And 
So it creates a delicately recursive situation that seems to be uh, completely self-dependent. So how do you interject from somewhere? Would we focus on the outside perspective and really giving a higher voice and uh, increasing, again, like you said, our population of immigrants? Or like, do you just have any thoughts on what type of initial action we need to take to kind of break that chain? Well, that's a very difficult question, and purely because Canada is a country that turns around over two trillion bucks a year. Big money. We are now part of a global economy. And I don't know if you've heard of WikiLeaks. There's a gentleman there called Julian Assange. Now, I had some time to listen to some of the stuff while it was leaked. And overall, this is the message that I get from those leaks. It doesn't matter who governs in modern global capitalism, as long as there's stable governance for capital accumulation and capital. That is basically the message that I pick up in Zimbabwe and wherever they're speaking about. So there's certainly, we've moved now, I think, almost to the post-nation state era where business bigger than countries. I worked in the Middle East, and Exxon oil is bigger value-wise than country Sweden in GDP. And that's like one, one company. They employ their own military, their own security. The point I'm trying to make here is we no longer live in a world where political geographies and nation states are alone in terms of global decision making. There are major corporations, many, many, that are bigger than GDPs of countries. So these all play together. At a certain point in social theory, my students will learn that at a certain point in capitalist history, capital and governance slept in the same bed. Simple answer. But yes, my heart is with you, sir. That's it. Thank you. In the history of Grand Prairie, oh, Grand so Prairieopoly. <laughs> I'll bring it to our social evil. Perfect. Thank you very much.